after the new comic days, after the dinners, after the final night under those fluorescent lights, there was the Alternate Realities Gang, a community wrestling with the legacy of the store that brought us all together. In this final My Comic Shop History event, experience one last year with the AR crew in a story told over four seasons. And now, the music of Ralph Puma. I wanted to tell the truth, wanted to bring you down so bad that we'd both lose. I kept my mouth shut, you kept all our friends. They'll never hear this, never hear this anyway, anyway. Welcome to the My Comic Shop History Farewell Event. I'm your host, Anthony Desiato. This is For All Seasons, Chapter 3, Summer. And joining me in studio is the spirit of friendship and fun himself, the elder statesman of our group, Rich Roney. Welcome. Thank you. I'm thrilled to be here. We were just having a spirited discussion about the somewhat recently released Flash movie. You and I felt completely differently about the movie, which made for an enjoyable but maybe a little heated on my part conversation because I no. still haven't gotten over the movie. I did a whole two-hour discussion about it on Digging for Kryptonite. It was great to get your perspective and bringing it into the alternate realities realm. It was fun because these are the kinds of things we would talk about at the comic shop that, of course, is now no longer here. So for a few minutes there, it was like we were, we were back in that space talking about the big summer comic book movie. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I'm so excited to be here because... We are now doing this so close to the closing of the, the anniversary. Um, it's a little apropos that we closed July eight years ago. And now we're in the summer eight years later. So Yeah, we're recording this over 4th of July weekend. People will hear it not too long from now, about mid-July. But yeah, I mean, we just passed the eight-year anniversary of the store's closing, right? June 30th, 2015. Yes, literally yesterday. Wow. Almost a decade. Does it feel like it's been a decade or almost, or does it still feel like it was just yesterday that you were driving over every Saturday or every other Saturday for dinner? Quite frankly, COVID has made it seem longer in time. Um, I think had, had, had we not been sequestered the way we were with COVID, it would have seemed more recent. But that really broke up all those frequent drives I would do. Um, so it does seem a, a healthy eight years, um, and I'm sure we'll get into it. Many of us have incrementally started going different ways. Life events take over, and uh, the the weekend get-togethers, or the you know the frequent like you know every third week getting together for dinner. The the loss of those things. Uh, expands the amount of time since since we did it. So I do feel as time time has elapsed. So yes, I want to talk about kind of the state of our community and a recent instance where we did get together, an upcoming instance where some folks will be getting together, and it kind of is a follow-up to what has been discussed in previous episodes. But I do want to say, and I know I said this to you when you were on for the longer Halloween a couple of years ago now, and this comes up whenever we do these episodes, but Whenever we talk to people on or off mic about the extent to which they're keeping in touch with people, in most cases, people are in touch with maybe one, one or two folks from the, the group. Again, those large gatherings are exceedingly rare. But I would say the most common denominator in terms of who people are in touch with is Rich Roney. Is Rich Roney. And so publicly, once again, I do want to thank you personally because I'm fortunate enough to be one of those folks on that, on that call list. But on behalf of everyone else who you've you've kept in touch with, because it's it's not an easy thing. And I know, like, I know what you're going to say. I know you're going to say that you derive great enjoyment from the conversations you enjoy. them, I mean, I know you do, and I believe that. But at the same time, even with that, it still, it takes time and planning and effort to, to sit there on a Saturday and or Sunday and make those calls and talk to people for a half hour or an hour. I've done a lot of podcasting over the years, and... It, it definitely, I don't want to say it's such a drain, but it's, you know, when you're really in it and you're having a conversation and you're focused and you're intent, it is an expenditure of energy. And you're, and you're doing that on a regular basis. And again, it's the thing that we hear 
I think the most from people in terms of oh, who are you still in touch with? And it's you. So thank you. Well, it cuts, it's a two-way street uh, and, and not to sound repetitious, but I derive great joy out of it. it. It's my way to stay in touch with you guys. I mean, we had, you know, um, so many events, whether it was your wedding um, or other, you know, Drew's wedding and there have been funerals, you know, poor Marie. So we are a community. Bill Bill spoke about that. He's, I think one of Bill's phrases in your conversation with Bill was, hey, there's the family you're born into, and there's the family you choose, and the AR family is the one he chose. Uh, so I, I love these conversations when, when I am, and I think well, perhaps about two weeks ago, spontaneously, you and I spoke for about an hour. Um, uh, we've had a number of conversations where it's magic, right? <laughs> Too bad we can't, you know, bottle it and record it later. Yeah, no, I, I, I always enjoy them. And it's like, I'm sure I said this to you or about you on the show at some point, but I can't remember. And it's worth saying, because I really was thinking about this. Well, one of the nice things about this podcast now, it doesn't require a ton of prep. Unlike the other podcasts, I'm doing all this homework and reading and watching all this stuff. And I love it. It's fun. But I always have to make sure I carve out time when we do these AR catch-ups. It's like, okay, we'll just relax and we'll have a conversation. But I obviously think about who I'm going to be talking to. And the one thing, the thing I kept coming back to and thinking about you and our friendship is that I've been having those more or less weekly phone calls with you for two decades at this point, about. I mean, I met you when I was in high school and yes, it hasn't been every single week for all of those years, but it's, if you tally it all up, it's, it's a lot. And I can't help but think that that helped prepare and train me for doing this podcast because, and I, and I, I mean that sincerely because I think the art of conversation is something that does require some practice. And I, I really do imagine that having all of those talks, those sustained conversations that where we're volleying back and forth, right? And especially over those phone calls at the store as well. Yes. But as we know, at the store, people are coming and going, and you're, you're distracted, you're picking something up off the it's shelf, the phone rings. It's, it's not as sustained, but those phone calls, whether for a half hour or an hour, I think help prepare me, help train me for these marathon <laughs> recording sessions that we do. So again, once again, thank you. Well, listen, you and I have had some, uh, I don't want to, we've touched this on prior conversations. And Anthony, I don't remember when it was, but totally by destiny, there was one weekend when we both saw Superman on Earth, right? And my God, the magic we had. I think we spoke for over an hour dissecting that in an impromptu fashion. So um, I will say the weekend conversations I had with you and Bill and Steve and others, especially during COVID, really helped keep me, uh, you know, uh, away from going into uh, Cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. You know, they kept me kept me engaged and... Um, so I love these conversations when we do them. And I, uh, during COVID in particular, I, I valued our conversations even more. And I've talked about this. That's definitely a part of why I ramped up the podcasting the way I did. I mean, I was already planning to start digging for Kryptonite, the Superman show, but then adding the George Reeves Adventures of Superman rewatch, adding a Power Ranger show. I did a little book club run as well. I did a little YouTube thing with Sean Hendricks from Fat Moose for a few months. Because I was just, yes, I have my family, and of course, that's the most important thing, and they kept me sane and all that, but just being able to kind of have that other outlet and talk about this kind of stuff was huge, right? Yeah. So on top of the store being gone, now we also weren't really getting together in any fashion. So, you know, whether it's the phone calls or doing these podcasts, really, really all were a godsend. And I, I want to uh, volley a compliment back to you. So I have nine nieces and nephews, right? And um, all the boys, all the boys I've exposed to comics. Now, my brother Harry has three sons who are, um, I've probably in a bad fashion Im Im imprinted too much of my love of DC onto them. But they all love uh, DC. They love comics in general. But one of his sons uh, lives in uh, Johnson City, Tennessee, has had to drive up here for for weddings and stuff like that. 
He called me after he listened to the podcast that you and Bill did on the long Halloween. And he said he loved it. He listened to it twice. So he said he loved it. Uh, so uh, there were things I thought he might, you know, uh, gravitate towards things he and I had an interest, or maybe I was being the speaker. But he he evolved it beyond that. So he, he, was, he just wanted to give a shout out to you. Oh, well, I, I, I thank him. I appreciate that. And yeah, I always, I always love I mean, hearing from people generally, but especially when, and this comes up a bit where people tend to listen, it seems on commutes and trips and things like that. And, and I love that, right. To whatever extent we can help keep people company. And I use podcasts I, and really, I'm not in the car that much these days, but whether I'm doing kind of chores around the house or, or, you know, some kind of task at the computer that doesn't really re require total attention. I can actually listen to something while I do it. I love it. And, and it really does keep me company as well. So uh, that's very cool. And I'm glad, uh, I'm glad he enjoyed it. So yeah, eight years, kind of flashing back that, and I was, it's funny, I was going to, we're actually using my, my phone right now uh, to, to capture your video. So I can't pull it up, but I was going to double check the dates. But yeah, I mean, it was just over eight years ago. I want to say it was, the, that Friday where Bill and I hauled all those long boxes full of trades outside or, you know, out of the store, uh, loaded them up onto the truck, brought them to the Westies warehouse. And then that Saturday I recovered. I was just, I was, I was wiped after that Friday, but Bill was right back at it. And that's when we had all the whole crew of, of everyone who's been involved with the store, customers, just anybody. The dinner. The and dinner. then the dinner afterwards, right? Cause, and we've talked about this on the show, how, and you and I both had a similar reaction when we came late in the day to the store that Saturday. And at that point, it had really been dismantled and no longer looked like the store. And you know, you talked about your jaw being on the floor and it really conjured <sighs> that kind of bless you. So of, sorry. No, quite all right. But it, like it really conjured, you know, that kind of that kind of reaction. You're you're yeah, you're so right. For the benefit of the listeners, and I'll make this brief, but it's very top of mind. Uh Bill and I have discussed this, right? And the um, the pre-wedding party that you you organized in Terrytown, right? Bill and I were like, "What's going on? Is he going to go month to month?" There was so much content. Bill and I both said about three weeks before the absolute closing, and Bill said when he got off the plane and he walked in. He was just devastated. He was demoralized. Like, he goes, what's he done? He's taken a, a cup of water out of the ocean, right? But then to do everything that was done in those last two weeks, and to your point, that Saturday, that Saturday, whatever it was, just before July 1st, when I walked in and I saw it gutted. You were gutted. I was gutted. I thought, holy cow, there's walls or parts of walls that I've never seen. I never thought this place was this wide because there was so much content in it uh, from a visual standpoint. It kind of threw you off. No, totally. Again, I, I have to double check the math and the dates and all that. But if I'm not mistaken, so that was the Saturday we had the Last Supper, the huge gathering at Venetian Delight, the pizzeria on Central Avenue. And I want to say then that Sunday... Bill was still, there was still work to be done. I think Bill and I grabbed coffee that, that afternoon. Didn't they paint that Sunday night? Was that? They, they might have. And then I, I, and then it was that Monday that was the absolute last final day because I was at work and on my lunch break, I went over there just one last time and I was really only there for a few minutes. And then Steph and I actually had a concert. We went to a Gavin DeGraw concert at Madison Square Garden that night. So I wasn't there for what has been discussed on the podcast and in my comic shop country, the taking down of the sign. That happened, again, I believe that was Monday, June 30th, 2015, uh, where that, that, that last piece happened. But again, we've talked about it here and there, but when we did that finale episode of season one, it was that Friday night. So there were those pieces that still hadn't happened yet. And we've referenced them over the years, but I just kind of, as, as it's, as it's top of mind and as we're at this anniversary point, it felt and I worth think talking about. That Friday, when you and Bill took all the long boxes, I mean, I don't know how many, how many long boxes. As you say, we humped them. We humped, humped the boxes. Them. And I've, I had, Bill and I had never heard that word used in that way. I, I've come to understand that 
it it does have that meaning, but you don't tend to hear that a lot these days. So it really stood out when you were like, oh, you guys humped, we humped those boxes. Yeah. Yeah. There's, you watch Justified, right? Or a little bit of it at least. Yes. The first season, I think you might've, you might've gotten me the uh, first season. Amazing FX series with Timothy Oliphant, Walton Goggins. Actually, as we're recording this, it's on the verge of a, of a brief rev- revival for a limited series. But in any event, those two guys, they're on opposite sides of the law, but they have this shared history growing up in Kentucky together and working in the coal mines. And the phrase, we dug coal together, is something that comes up at critical junctures in the show and really accounts for, even though these guys are at odds, they're never going to be on the same side. There's still a bedrock of a friendship there between yeah. the two of them. They dug coal together. And in much the same way, Bill and I are very much on the same side. But even if we weren't, it's like we humped those boxes together. And I feel like we'll always have that. We humped those long boxes for the audience here, not to oversell it, but long boxes full of trade paperbacks and hardcovers, not regular comics. And we, we humped those boxes. So we'll always have that, just like Raylan and, and Boyd uh, if digging I coal. May, <laughs> I, I, I welcome your estimation. How many boxes? Because I think, as Steve said, he had to get a, a third room right? It wasn't as large as the first two. I'm, now I'm going to go. It was not as large as the first two units, but there was still a third one that I think just held the long boxes, right? It was dozens of boxes because it was, at a minimum, it was all of the, we had trades underneath the back issue bins. And there were definitely trades on the steel shelves in the, in the back of the store. Or actually, you know what? Let me walk that back. Under the back issue bins, were they just more comics or were they actually trades? It's I funny. think they were both. It I might think, have been a mix. We'll go with that. <laughs> I, 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 you know, there were some boxes. Sean and I discussed this, and then Steve uh, alluded to it. He would pull a long box out, and maybe two-thirds of it would be, these are my words, you know, books that are only worth 50 cents, Right. And then you'd find maybe, you know, seven or eight inches of Silver Age stuff, you know, like the first appearance of The Vision or a Jack Kirby Fantastic Four. You'd find really value, but Steve would just uh, drop it wherever there was space available. And Steve's attitude was, I'll organize it later. So I think there was a healthy amount of some degree of back issues but there were other boxes that were a mixture of trades and back issues and still others that were just trades. But I do remember prior to uh, the closing, Steve would have those big uh, diamond boxes obscuring what you could go look at. And there'd be a sign on top that is say, says, stay out. And then he would carefully write a second sign underneath that would go, this means you dumbass. Only Steve would go to that level, that nth degree. Um, yes. Oh, it's interesting. Oh, I wish I had screenshotted this or, or remembered it more specifically, but I came across this on Twitter very recently where I think one shop owner shared an image of a sign from another store. And I'm paraphrasing, but the gist of it was it, it, it was, it was addressing a, a dress code and it was like, if you wear the the image or the insignia of a comic book character, you better know what universe they're in. And the example they gave, I guess there had been some someone who came into the store wearing like a Flash shirt and they thought Flash was in the Marvel universe. And this, as you might expect, elicited quite a reaction online, a negative one, and rightfully so. When we talk about this idea of gatekeeping and like keeping people out, I feel like this is a great example of that. And yes, it might sound ridiculous to us, like you don't know what what world the Flash is in, but everybody comes at this from a different place and a different level of experience. And rather than trying to shame someone and turn someone someone away with a sign like that, how about instead you take the opportunity to say, hey, you're wearing that shirt, you have some interest in the character, let me show you some of these DC stories with the character. Like you have an opportunity that you're squandering. And so I bring all of this up because over the years we've, had a lot of fun at Steve's expense, and uh, justifiably so. I think though some of those signs were were, <laughs> were oh. a little a little out there, but certainly for those who were were part of the store, even I think the, the regular customers, I think everyone took it in stride. You do always wonder if there were someone new, you know, could that be off putting? But it still, to me at least, doesn't rise to the level of that example I just gave, where that's I feel like really keeping people 
out in a way that is is really inappropriate. I don't remember it, but didn't Steve post a very lengthy note uh, prior when he first? Oh made yeah, the first of course, decision. the infamous the infamous closing announcement. Yeah, I and I I only remember vague generalities of it, but I think he got a lot of his his frustration out. I'm going to use all this to circle back to the, the that Friday. I don't know. There must have been like 70 or more long boxes that you guys, between the shelving in the back room, and there was either two or three shelves that were full of, of long boxes. And some of them were half boxes, but there was, there was a surplus of all the extra trades that were not on the shelves. Then you had the stuff underneath the back issue bins. Those were heavy, heavy stuff. But I think at midnight or late that night, you did a podcast with with Bill and Steve. And I, all I remember is one of the famous things. The timing was magnificent. Steve started talking about proper planning prevents poor performance. And he just got quiet for a second. And Bill goes, yeah, what happened? <laughs> Yeah, and no, I, I, I planned too much. I re, yeah, the, <laughs> and I do remember that. No, that was epic. That was when I sort of look as as we're now here in the penultimate episode ever, and I do mean it. On my comic shop history, we only have our fall episode. You'll be back. Steve will be back. We'll see to what extent we can bring Bill in. We'll circle back to that. But I know he wants to fly in and be in person, and if that works, great. I feel like we we might have him on a screen there. But however he's represented uh, is is all good. <laughs> but. Yeah, I mean that was when I when I look back at kind of the the life of this podcast and all of the recordings that we've done and you know now I've been for these past few years recording at home and whether it's the case of someone coming over or most of them are done remotely but for years I was first at alternate realities and then going around to all these other comic shops but that one that that night beneath the fluorescent lights that night after we had we had humped those long boxes and the store was mostly empty but not yet dismantled as it would be the next day and it was late and it was just the three of us i remember i went home in between and i showered and i changed i was like gross when i came back and set up and we did that and it was just the three of us although there was there was some guy who was helping out who was doing either painting or electrical work in the back for for part of it and then he left i i, I don't the, the details are lost to time now but for the most part it was just the three of us late at night after everything we had done right before those last couple of days and that, that really was one of the most special recording experiences. And we got a lot out and there was a lot of emotion. And it was, it was, uh, that one's really up there. That was special. Steve had such admiration and respect. And he considered you and Bill as close to being sons to him as possible. And I think he even alluded to that in that, that discussion eight years ago that he, he considered with admiration and, uh, great pride and respect you guys effectively his sons i want to kind of staying on this theme though of i uh, no what? offense i know steve and i are the same age but i consider you guys my friends <laughs> <laughs> i haven't relegated you to uh it's funny and i guess it's different depend on depending on who you ask but i feel like certainly for those of us kind of in the same age group or at least i won't speak for anyone else but for me yeah i've definitely always seen steve as sort of a father type figure You've always been more, I feel like, in the in the uncle category, if we're going to put a familial designation on it. Jay Mizell always felt like another grandfather. Oh, yeah. uh, and then guys like, well, you know, like Bill or, you know, Sean and Tom back in the day when we were hanging out all the time, you know, very much like brothers. Drew, I don't know, old, older brother, cousin, I don't know where Drew falls on that. But yeah, and again, it depends who you ask and their age and when they came into the store and all of that. But yeah, I mean, when we say that we're a family, I think we do kind of feel and think in those terms, but just kind of on the note of the community and, and just keeping in touch. And again, going back to your efforts, one thing I was actually thinking about, I was curious because as we've talked about on the show, I mean, you've known Steve now over 50 years. Yes. Right. Yeah. Going back to that infamous, uh, he got a light. Yeah. <laughs> you don't smoke, do you? And that whole thing. And of course we joke you, you should have just said, yeah, I got a light. <laughs> yeah. Filter or unfiltered. <laughs> But you guys, so you were obviously in high school together, and then you went to different colleges and different careers, and you've you, you know, you had a, a lengthy stretch in your career where you were traveling all of the time. You've lived in different places, yet you've 
you've remained in each other's lives and you've obviously you became this cornerstone of the alternate realities community. And we, we always cite you as really the driving force and people gathering for those dinners and all this. But I'm curious, was there, was there ever a point where you guys kind of fell out of touch? And, and as far as keeping in touch, was that something that going back to what we were saying before, you were the one who was kind of initiating or was it kind of both of you? I was was kind of curious about that. I, boy, we did have times either because of like when I lived in Detroit or I was traveling a lot to different cities, we kind of fell out of touch. Um, I do think on the weekends... I think I almost a hundred percent of the time I make the call to Steve. Um, and it's funny in the same discussion you had with Steve, Bill and I discussed this and this is going to boomerang against me, but I'm going to get it out since I'm, you know, since I'm gone this far, but Steve said, Oh yeah, Rich Roney doesn't, doesn't keep in touch anymore. He used to call me every weekend. And now he only calls me maybe, maybe once on a weekend. Well, about five weeks ago, I called him as he was doing some stuff in his new home, right? And I call him, and his first words are, You have the uncanny ability to always call at the worst possible time, right? <laughs> now, I've said this for like 10, 12 years. Just let it go to voicemail, right? I'm not going to be hurt. Um, but he goes, you have the uncanny ability to always call at the worst possible time. I'm putting up shelves now, and they're very heavy. Is it an emergency? No. I'll call you next week. <laughs> Fat Moose Comics is New Jersey's best and oldest comic book store. Established in 1982 and under new ownership since 2020, Moose sells a wide selection of of new and old comics from every publisher, action figures, graphic novels, posters, statues, and more. If you're looking for something and they don't have it, they can probably get it for you. They know a guy. Visit Fat Moose in Whippany, New Jersey, the next time you're in the Garden State. And be sure to reach out via the Fat Moose Comics Facebook page. Acme Comics is a locally owned and operated full-service comic book store in Greensboro, North Carolina, for people of all ages and walks of life. Now in its 40th year, this multiple-time Eisner Award nominee features a significant contemporary and vintage back-issue selection, as the Acme team uses their collective knowledge and resources to connect you with the best material. Mail order subscriptions to new releases are available, and all offerings are available anywhere via mail order. Follow Acme on social media and eBay, listen to the Acme cast on all podcast services, and visit acmecomics.com for much more. I feel like that's classic Steve where it's like he 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 cares or, or he wants to talk to you so much or he you know doesn't want to just ignore you. Like that's the thing. He he cares enough. He doesn't want to just ignore you, but but he's still Steve and he can't you know he can't just pick up and be like, "Hey, this isn't a good time. I'll call you right back." He has to make the point and let you know why it's a bad time and make sure he's you know. So <laughs> enraged he's so angry and even in his rage he goes is it an emergency and bill said something like you know i had to tell him yeah i'm outside pittsburgh i got a slow leak can you come out and pick me up right (laughs) he probably would well funny enough that's a perfect segue because i i wanted to talk about a recent dinner that we actually did have it was a small group but we did get together Steve was going to join, but he got a flat tire and he wasn't able to make it. So you talk about just when you mentioned about, you know, making up a a story about road trouble, he actually did have, have an issue with his car. And, but this, you know, it just makes me laugh because we were, we were outside Mickey Spillane's. We were, I was the first one there. And then you and Mike San Gregorio shut up. And then we started to have a little bit. The weather was so pleasant the air was so pleasant it was beautiful and as as you guys were getting there i got this text from steve and he said he did make the point to say he was like i would have which it's funny he managed to insult both of us in in a single stroke because he was like i would have called rich i.e i'm I'm his second choice because i would have (laughs) would have called rich but i know his phone will be off so he managed to get the dig in it that that both of us he's not wrong though You, you know you do often have your phone off 
But why? I don't get this. What? Why why you don't just have your phone on all the time, even if you don't answer it. That's interesting. Okay. I feel like this is very much a generational thing. And also, too, it's funny when you talk about, you know, calling Steve and him not being able to answer. That, too, it's really funny because, I mean, generally speaking, a lot, most people, it seems, are not talking on the phone much anymore, right? Most people are using the phones for anything. It's, you know, for texting. Uh, and even with a call, like, I've seen articles and things about this where th- there is a school of, th- I'm not saying I feel this way, but, like, there is a school of thought out there now, I think probably among the the, the youths, that it's almost... Again, I'm not saying this is my, how I feel, but it's almost rude to call someone out of the blue without it being scheduled because it's like you're, you're, you're interrupting them, right? As opposed to texting and saying, hey, give me a call when you get a chance or hey, is this a good time to talk? Interesting. Just calling someone out of the blue. Again, these days, given how rarely that seems to happen for most people and how little people you tend to use their phones as a phone. So well, it's just interesting. I'll give a quick segue. With my nephews who are all in their 20s, I will text them and go, hey, when's a good time for us to talk this weekend, right? So most of the time I'll text them and ask them to return with a, uh, you know, hey, call me at 7.30 or call me at 9 or stuff like that. The exception would be my nephew, Brendan, who's down in uh, Johnson City, uh, Tennessee, or Kentucky. I always get those two confused. But he's a morning, he's up like at 5.30. So I can call him at 7.30 and I know he's going to pick up, right? But the others, I I try to text first and find a convenient time. But just this past week, I was at work and I was trying to do some stuff. We had a finalist meeting. And I was trying to get an answer from one of our underwriters so I could go back to the RFP. And I called, but a good friend of mine was sitting in my cube with me and someone else walked up. And this fella who was sitting at the adjacent chair is maybe 50 years old. And he just looked at the other guy and he goes, about me, he goes, he can't help himself, right? (laughs) He can't help himself. So I think some of it is just um, the age. And uh, I, I will try to text more to find a convenient time for some people. Um, and you've been very gracious. You've actually done that with me a number of times and that, especially now in the, in the realm of, of parenthood, it's definitely, <laughs> I definitely appreciate it. Sometimes it's hard, you know, I, I, like I can't just drop stuff, but, uh, again, it's, I just, I think it's interesting to talk about, but I, but, but, but please, I'm not bringing this up. We, we just talked about how, how you go out of your way to keep in touch. I'm not trying to add another <laughs> layer of difficulty to that, please. <laughs> just, but it just makes me laugh again, especially going back to Steve's reaction. So, uh, it is kind of funny, but yeah. So we had this dinner, right? And this is, oh, Memorial Day weekend. It was memori- so on the last holiday weekend, Mike San Gregorio organized this dinner. And look, we had talked about this in the, in the preceding two episodes of, of this farewell event of how no one usually takes the reins. I've done it in the past. You've done it in the past. And Mike is the other one who has done it and very graciously did it again. And I said this to him out after the dinner outside. I was like, I, I appreciate him doing it because... I, and we've talked about this. I, I, one of the reasons I kind of backed away from doing it was in terms of project managing it, as I know you like to call it, just trying to get a response from people, trying to get a firm commitment, trying to get a head count. It, it got a little difficult. And, and Mike attested to the fact that there were a bunch of people he emailed who never who responded, never responded or never yeah. gave a firm answer. Although it seemed like a lot just didn't respond at all. And that to me, like, I would get frustrated by that. So that's why I don't, but he, he seems to take it in stride. So I'm like, right on. That's good. I'm glad. And he did, in terms of project management, and tell me if you feel otherwise, he did everything that one could do. He sent out the email. He created a doodle poll and had everybody fill in their availability. He picked the date that worked for the largest number of people. He made the reservation. He made the reservation. He even uh, took the known responses, added maybe three or four seats just because you didn't know. Um, we've spoken about this, what would you say, for 10 or 12 years that we love everyone, right? But there's a degree of non-response. And and that could be one of three things. Like you're trying to logistically find a way to, you got to work something out before you can answer. Or you've just totally, hey, I'll show up and just, you know, or you're not going to come. But 
but it makes it difficult. Um, it makes it difficult logistically. It's funny. I, I I don't mean to sound like an old man, and I don't mean to say something especially else. to me who's twice no. your age. <laughs> <laughs> no, but and and like I'm not saying I'm not breaking any new ground here with what I'm about to say. I think these trends are, are things that people are well aware of. But but in these recent years, with the plethora of options available to people in terms of things to do, things to watch, whatever, ways to communicate. I do feel like it has gotten a lot harder. It's much easier for people to, again, either not respond or hit maybe, right? You know, I mean, I'm even thinking of, and this is dating myself, even <laughs> like a Facebook event. And it's like, even Facebook is, uh, you know, not, not the, not the hot thing anymore, but it, you know, to get people to actually say like, yes, I will be there and actually show up right where I guess back in the day when you didn't have the ability to, to, to get someone on the phone at the last second, right? Like, maybe you would be more inclined to show up because it's like, well, I, I can't get in touch with them. So it's like, if I don't go, then I've just stood them up. But it's like now, you know, you could text someone at the last minute, but oh, I can't make it. You can procrastinate. Yeah. Yeah. I guess where maybe it's a little disheartening is, I guess I always feel it's, our our group is, is I would hope that our group would be the exception where it's like, maybe, yeah, maybe if you get a Facebook event invitation, not you, because of course you're not on Facebook, but like if one were to get a Facebook event invitation, yeah, maybe if it's whatever it is, you hit, hit maybe and it's, it's not the end of the world or interested now is, is the new thing. But I, I would, I would think like for people in our group, like when you get that email about one of our gatherings, that would, that would engender, that would elicit an actual Elevated. response or a firm response or something. But you know, and I have no, and look, in fairness, not, I don't think any of them even listen to this, but if anybody does, <laughs> in fairness, I, they could have had any number of reasons why, why they didn't respond. Right. I have, you know, they didn't want to talk to Mike. I, I mean, I have, like, I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea. So, uh, you know, I'm not, I don't say that with any condemnation, but it's just it, the way Mike presented it, it seemed like there were enough people who just didn't respond at all, where I think it justifies this conversation of, it's just like, yeah, it's, that was kind of a bummer to hear that. That's all. Yeah. But now, we did have, we did, no, go ahead. Uh, now, for Steve, I think you and I have both been to his house. It's not that far from White Plains High School. He walked from his White Plains house to the White Plains train station, which is, I think, about three and a half miles, perhaps. But he had those big black boots of his on. He said it was really, you know. Towards the end, he was dragging, especially as he went up, like you know, uh, some of those hills um, near Old, Mo not not that far from where you use you previously lived. But then I think he got to White Plains train station and he got in touch with Evan, right? And Evan said, "Do you want me to call you an Uber, right?" And that just blew Steve's mind, right? And and then also, you know, processing, well, wow, maybe I could have. Well, if I, why didn't he call one of us, right? have dinner and then I can drop him off at the train station on the, you know, you could. Well, that's the thing. And when he texted to say, I got a flat tire and I forget exactly what he said that he was, Oh, that Tesla road service roadside assistance couldn't come until the next day or something like that. And just for, for context, we mentioned this in the last episode when he was on, but yeah, he now, he now moved. He has a new home uh, in, in, in Connecticut, but uh, the, the previous Odo Castle uh, is still in the in the family, and his son will be moving in. So third generation, and that's kind of what we figured was going. We figured he would just kind of stay at at the White Plains house, or, or whatever the case may be. I didn't know, but in my text response, I was like, "Oh no!" I was like, "We're so sorry. Like you'll be missed." I said, "Do you need anything?" No response. <laughs> and if it were anyone else, I probably would have started. I would have gotten worried. I'm like, "Oh, maybe I gotta track him down." But it's like I, with with Steve, I figure oh, he just. I, as I've come to find with him and texting. It's usually one of two extremes. Either he just doesn't respond, <laughs> which doesn't happen that often. Or, I know the other, <laughs> you're going to get, he sent me <laughs> on my iPhone two text messages. One of them I like copied and counted the words. It was 461 words, oh. right? That was only one of the two. His ability, I mean, I've had formal memos at work that are shorter than some of his texts. He he's got so descriptive and such an eye for detail and he doesn't really get to the punchline too fast. <laughs> no, but you know what? They're always well written. The I feel like the content is good. It's not 
you know, understand why he's doing it, even though it, it, it he doesn't maybe need to go into that level of, of depth, but it's okay. That, and you know. the following day, I did call him. I go, hey, is everything okay? He goes, yeah, Tesla couldn't get there, you know, so I had to walk to White Plains train station and take a train, I guess, up to Brewster or Poughkeepsie, and Evan picked him up, and or Ann picked him up. I, I totally checked out on that. Um. But I said, why didn't you call me? I could have come and picked you up. You could have had dinner, and then I could have dropped you off because I'd go by White Plains on, on my way home. And he goes, no, that would have taken too long. It would have been 20 minutes for you to get over there and another 20 minutes to get back. And I'm thinking, well, I could really, I could have helped you, right? You could have had dinner, and then I could have, you know. But it, Steve, I think once he makes that decision, he, he's got an iron will. Indeed, indeed. But he was missed. He was missed. So I appreciate him not wanting to be an imposition, but it's like we would have, any one of us would have gladly done it and we would have been happy to have him there. So he was missed. It was a small group. It was obviously you, me, Drew, Phil, who I hadn't Pete. seen in a really long time. Yeah, Pete, Steve Ryan in a very rare surprise appearance. Carolyn. Of course, Mike Sangregorio and Carolyn and, uh, and her husband, uh, Vinny. And that's nine. And I think that was everybody. Boy, if I forgot anyone, I'm real sorry. But again, I don't know that they listen, so it's all right. But <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think that was everyone. The other weird thing was Mike, Mike had allegedly made a reservation. I trust that he did. And oh. you and I were, we were kind of far back at the entrance. So I don't know exactly what was going on, but it seemed like they didn't have the reservation. I agree with you. But what was... Kind it was of it was a ghost town. Baffling to me was they the the staff <laughs> looked like so out of sorts about where they were going to seat us. And look, I guess at that point we didn't know for sure that it was only going to be nine of us. Like I think Mike had made a reservation for twenty. I think you're right. Because even though he didn't hear from people, he's like, well, in case they show up, and so, or they bring they show up and bring a significant other, you know? Right. Like I let him know ahead of time. I because initially I said to him, I was like, I might I might come myself. Steph and I might come and we'll have my mom watch Milo or maybe we'll bring Milo and we'll all go. And then in the end, I was like, I'll just go by myself. So, and but, but I let Steve and Ann at yep. one time. So it, it could have been quickly been for every um, consumer or AR individual, there could have been a significant other. Yes. Um, but it was baffling. It felt like something out of the office or Arrested Development where they were looking like, oh, we don't, like, we don't know where to put them. And like, the, the, the restaurant's empty. It's like, <laughs> what's the problem? <laughs> And it didn't get in, because again, it's not, I don't, I could be wrong. I don't think they had like a ton of other reservations because we were there a decent amount and it, it got busier, but it wasn't like, oh my God, it was jam packed. And so they were anticipating, you know, reservations later or whatever, they, whatever the case may be. But in, in any event, they, they put some tables together. We, we had our, we had our catch up and it was, again, I'm like an old man. It's too loud. It's too loud in there. Do you not feel this? I feel like, I feel like I'm shouting when we're there. I, I've gotten so old, my hearing's not that good. So, so I didn't have that, that problem, right? Um, next time we do another dinner in a public setting, uh, I'll be more conscious of it. But for me, that time I, where I was seated, everything worked. So it wasn't uh, problematic for me. Yeah, that's fine. I, but, you know, it was, it was, uh, we had a good time and it was nice to see folks we hadn't seen in a long time. But it definitely, I, I talked about this with Roby when he was on the podcast two years ago, very early on when we did the longer Halloween. And we spoke about this then and it proved true at this dinner where, what any kind of relationship, but especially these these friendships, it's like when you're when you're really in it and you're seeing each other all the time, like we used to. The conversations are different. The conversations can be more specific. They can be more present. You're you're kind of talking about what's going on, and I'm not saying that didn't happen, but it tended to be more catching up. What have you been? And again, it's, I don't. I'm not saying this as a negative, but it's just something that you, I kind of notice as far as just the change, right? It's like we see each other so infrequently that. It just, it does kind of have a different feel to it now. It's lovely to catch up, but that is more, to me at least, what it felt like. Now, on the other end of the table, and you were kind of maybe somewhat in the in the middle, so you maybe you kind of got different flavors of this. Because like where I was with Drew and Steve Ryan and Phil, it was a lot of catching up and talking about kids and talking about jobs and all that. Phil's the other name. 
No, I said him. Oh, I, I, I yeah, didn't. I'm almost, okay, I'm almost certain. But if I missed him, my apologies. But then on the other end of the table, you had Pete and Carolyn and Mike. And I think they're in more regular contact. They, the part, you, as, as you are as well with the book club that, that Mike organizes. So that might have been a little bit more of a present conversation. I, mean, I don't know. Actually, I have not gone to those book clubs. One of the last ones was during COVID. Oh, uh, does he still do it? Yes, he does. Oh. Um, there was one like in April. I had planned for, and then at the last minute I couldn't, I couldn't attend. Gotcha. Um, or maybe it was March. It was probably March. So I, I even some of the book clubs, uh, I'm not doing them with the frequency with which I re- previously uh, attended them. I talked about this on another, on, I guess the last episode, but we did a screening of my comic shop country back in February, President's, President's Day, I think. And it was organized by Escape Pod Comics for their 10th anniversary, and they booked a theater out on Long Island. It was fantastic. It was, uh, it, it was really a great event and a solid turnout. A wonderful theater. It was the the pre- the audio visual presentation was top notch. So I'm sitting there enjoying my own work. I'm like, this looks and sounds great. But as as I said, I what was so cool about it was just like so much time had passed that I could just watch it as an audience member ah. and. That's the first time I think I've really been able to watch that one in that way. Because every other time it was so close to having finished it. And it's just like, okay, I know this comes here. I know this comes there. And I didn't have any of that. And Sean Hendricks came from Fat Moose. But I thought of you because, and this is why I bring this up, not just to pat myself on the back here, is, you know, you have that moment in the film, in my comic shop country, where you talk about how Fat Moose is the closest to alternate realities in terms of atmosphere. You enjoy growing. We have some great B-roll of you chatting it up with with Gene Cahill from Fat Moose and Sean and shaking hands and laughing and all that great stuff. But you did talk about how it's still not, quote unquote, your store. And we filmed that a few years ago now. So I, that, that's kind of what I wanted to ask you here. And I know you and I have talked off mics. I guess I know the answer to this. But just kind of where you are in terms of comics and comic shops. Like where, where are you at this at this point in time? How how often are you even going to a store? What are you getting? Like what kind of experience are you having? My purchasing and reading of comics has really dropped. I mean, I so it's early July. I think if I've purchased. 10 or 12 books is this year, that would be a lot. Um, uh, it's not doing it for me anymore. I mean, uh, there was a, a relaunch of Green Lantern, Hal Jordan Green Lantern. You know I love that, right? Um, we have uh, spoken about uh, that 12-part uh, that miniseries that Jeff Johns is doing with Justice Society. I bought the first three. Things were going on. I couldn't get to the store for the fourth. I figured, ah, screw it. I'll just wait for the trade. Um, the only thing I'm, I bought two issues of Mark Wade's Captain Marvel by, uh, uh, with Dan Mora. I love that. I really enjoy that. But I think this year I've only purchased 12 books. Uh, uh, I guess the repetitiveness or seeing stuff before, like quite frankly, I, I had a discussion um, with with Sean about this. Um, this is our Sean from AR. See, about- Sean Hendricks, who who I'm I'm sure will be listening to this. His ears perked up because he heard his name, and now he's probably deflated. But we've already said his name a few times, so he should be all right. Well, uh, before I come to the uh, <laughs> Sean McInerney thing. Uh, about two weeks ago, I really wanted to get that second issue of Shazam, right? Yeah, not Captain Marvel. Yeah, I mean, oh boy, what the did... The Captain. The Captain, right? Th- I that- like that. I like that, though. Anyway, look, I get to, like, they can't call him Captain Marvel. I, you know, not, not, I mean, and I'm not even talking about any legalities. It's just like, just in terms of market, why, why would you <laughs> use the name of another, another company at this point? But I feel like... And again, I know you might feel differently, and I've spent a lot more time with Captain Marvel, but I feel like the Captain, to Wade's credit, is a solid compromise. I agree. Because Shazam is dumb. I'm sorry. I agree. Like, it makes no sense. How is your name, how do you go by the name that is yeah. also the same word that you say to transform? Right. You can never say your name? Right, right. So ca- the Captain is, is fine by me. It, it, it's an excellent compromise, <laughs> right? Um, 
but I wanted to read the second issue. I love Mora's artwork. I like what they did in the first issue. I had to work late. I couldn't, I couldn't get to the place. So I went to, um, uh, in Dover, there's the Joe Kubert Art School, and they've got, a uh, Dewey's has relo- relocated there. So I went in there. They were sold out, right? So I figured, well, shit, I'm not going to drive all the way over to Parsippany, right? Uh, so I called, and I Justin answered the phone. I said, hey, Justin, this is Rich Roney. He gave me a big hello. So this is where I speak about with admiration, admiration to Fat Moose. They have such a great spirit. So I, I get Justin. I go, hey, Justin, I'm sorry to bug you. Can you run over? Do you have issue number two? So he says, hang on. and runs over. He goes, which cover do you want? And he, he, he put it underneath the counter for me. I got in there about 40 minutes later, and it was waiting for me. So whatever Sean has done there, he's created this wonderful spirit where they're very, very, very pro their family. And very graciously, Justin said, look, you're Mr. Friendship and Fun. We're going to take care of you, you know. Uh, so he, he helped me out. Um, but my reading with, with Sean McInerney, I did buy the first issue of Green Lantern. And I said, I, I, I can't do this. I love Zermanko's artwork. I love it. But I said, I've seen these storylines before with previous, re- like he's fighting a manhunter. I saw that with Pacheco like 10 or 11 years ago. Yep. And then Sinestro's hovering in the background. I saw that in the 2016 relaunch. So the fact that I've seen so many of these things, it 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 just doesn't do it for me. Now, that's a flaw with me. Look, I'm 68. I've been reading these things for 60 years. So I the potential to reiterate a plot line. Uh now I'm gonna hone in to something both. I'm going to dovetail something from Bill, something from you. For your other AR finales, I listened to the discussion with Steve, and then I listened to about the first 20 or 25 minutes of the discussion with Bill, and I still haven't finished it. I've just had too much going on. But um, Bill spoke about, hey, maybe... Maybe the time for comic books has passed. How do you keep an 80-year-old character fresh and interesting? Because maybe it's just past. You know, it's it, it's it's going to be relegated to the past and relegated to history. But then you said this a few years ago when you you loaned me your um, the office from Britain, right? And you said the nice thing is they tell a finite story. They've got you know they. To use phraseology, we both said they know when to get off the stage, right? But then after listening to the bill going, you know, maybe maybe the era has passed for these monthly periodicals. All of a sudden, I've seen about seven or eight miniseries. I mean, you've got uh, uh, the Unstoppable Doom Patrol, which is like seven issues. You've got a 12-part Green Arrow, a 12-part Justice Society. You've got a six-part Hawk Girl. You've got the relaunch of three Justice Society three-parters. So I think they're moving, Anthony, to what you said. You said this four, five, six years ago. This would be a better way to go. Come in, tell a really good story, and then stop. Don't try to make it uh, an ongoing monthly periodical. There, it, it, you might not have enough content or interest for that. No, it's true. And yeah, I think in terms of format, I think that makes a lot of sense. You keep you keep the character fresh, the creators fresh, and you keep the audience engaged, right? And you can kind of offer something else when when one thing ends. And if something really takes off like a rocket, you can always make it an ongoing or you can do a sequel. So I think it gives some flexibility. And I think with the most recent Green Arrow, I don't know who's drawing it nor who's writing it. I don't know. But it started out as a six-parter, but sales were so good they extended it to a 12 part. Yeah. I mean, I feel like even just in terms of spin, it's always better to, you know, to, to, you, you know, initially offer or promise less and then you can always, you can always add to it as opposed to, Hey, we have this great ongoing series. And then it's like, Oh, it's issue six is our last one. But no, that was an interesting conversation. I, I, I get where Bill's coming from. And every, I think everyone, you know, you know, kind of, I think there are certain walls that we each hit as comic book fans at some point. I mean, you're talking about, a, like in your case, a 60-year tenure following these characters. 
yeah, I mean, I that's very difficult to sustain. I mean, even in my 30 years of reading these, there have definitely been stretches where I was I was all in and firing on all cylinders and, and buying and reading so much stuff and really engaged. And then a very long stretch, really up until I started doing Digging for Kryptonite, where I was really not following much. And now I've gotten back into it. And, and now there's a whole different reason why I'm reading everything that I am, right? And so that's allowed me to kind of tap into it in a different way and engage with the material in a different way. So, yeah, I mean, I, it's, I, I don't know, like personally, it's hard. I don't know. Maybe I can answer this because there's next to nothing that I'm reading that's not for a podcast. So so if I weren't doing the podcast, would I would I be reading anything? I, I, I don't know. Maybe not. That's not necessarily, though, an indictment of the books themselves. But again, more just kind of t- to your point, like where I am right now and why I like reading what I'm reading, right? I think it's if in and of itself, but also because I know it's it's going to be part of a conversation that I'm having and this exploration of the character that I'm that I'm going on. So like I give, you know, again, you mentioned Sean McInerney. Like I haven't talked to him in a long time, but I know he's still he's still buying and reading this stuff. I think even his he's scaled back a little scaled bit. Scaled back a little bit. Yeah. I mean it's just it's it's hard, I think, to really and especially over the course of this podcast. And we you know we've talked to a lot of retailers and fans and collectors and some creators. And it's just, I think it's a very hard thing to sustain at, at a high level for, for decades for the reasons that you're talking about. There is, there are always going to be sort of, you know, creative peaks and valleys. There's going to be repetition. And also too, like you said, these characters have been around for so long. There are only so many different stories to tell. So inevitably you're going to see things repeat. You also have the phenomenon of fans becoming creators. And so people who grew up enjoying a certain story or a certain type of story or Or character environment or or. right. That's, you know, a lot of times they'll kind of want to play with that when they now have the opportunity to write or draw something. And it's not that they're just rehashing the same thing, but you know, they're putting a little spin on it, but it still feels probably feels familiar. And for them and for readers, maybe who grew up with that, that's a positive thing, right? Like I see things now that, I, you know, I, I can see, it's funny, partially in the comics, but also, you know, on the Superman and Lois television show, those, the people involved with that show clearly, they, they draw from a lot across Superman media, but it really seems like the 90s triangle era of the comics is, is an inspiration for them ah. on that show. And I'm, I love that. I mean, that's perfect for me, but for others, you know, they might not get as much mileage out of it and I, I can appreciate that. So you know, so you have all of these things going that I think, again, all points to just like, I think how hard it is as a fan to just kind of, again, maintain that high level of interest for, for, for years and decades. I think inevitably you're going to have, and I think you've talked to, and I've talked to a good number of fans and collectors and a very common theme is, you know, either, you know, kind of uh, scaling back at some point or, or leaving the hobby altogether and then coming back. I think very common, very natural piece of this. I agree. I agree. Thank you to all members of my Patreon community for supporting this podcast. If you like what you hear and are not a member yet, please consider signing up today at patreon.com slash Anthony Desiato. We offer a variety of monthly reward tiers and discounted annual memberships are available too. Beginning at the $1 level, you can listen to Digging for Justice, my exclusive DC movie rewatch podcast. Click the link in the show notes for more. If you're looking for other ways to support the show, leaving a rating and review on Apple Podcast goes a long way and only takes a second. You're also welcome to join the conversation on social media via the links in the show notes. Last but not least, we are an affiliate of BCW Supplies, so the next time you need to restock on comic book bags, boards, boxes, and more, be sure to use promo code FSP to save 10% on your order. That's FSP for Flat Squirrel Productions. It helps support the show too. Thank you. So circling back, if I may, uh, it, it struck me what Bill said. And his conclusion was almost like, look, I, I think the era, and I forget what his words were. I'd have to listen more carefully. But I think the era of monthly periodicals is past, right? But then I saw this, like you said, finite miniseries, very targeted, a specific uh, character, creator, six-parter, done. I'm more impressed with that um, because y- you can look at it and if, if you don't get it, big whoop. 
If you enjoy it, it's only six issues. It's a trade you can put up on your shelf and enjoy. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, something that's, I guess, a little bit more of a trend. I know Marvel had been doing it for a while. Oh, yeah, I don't I don't know if this is official official, but it seems like DC is doing, or at least toying with the idea of doing the legacy numbering, a la Marvel, where it's like, this is issue number 21 of volume five, but it's also 950 if you tally up all the volumes. I like that a lot. I think, to me, that's kind of a, an ideal compromise because that lower number is probably uh, more inviting to a new reader, but for people who have been following it, it's like, hey, it is part of this larger story and you kind of, and even just in terms of cataloging and managing your collection, I think that that goes a long and way. And to your point, the most recent Batman- That's I what I was thinking Was of. simultaneously, I think, like issue 135 and 900. So it, it, it appealed to both, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. The other thing that you and I, we, this has come up in, in our various phone calls, just kind of once again, highlighting the importance of that parking lot at all oh. realities. It, it, it really, it, there, there were so many reasons why I think our community came together and, and grew and flourished and why it was this place of friendship and fun and, and it, it ultimately is the people. But also we really can't discount that location and that parking because there and you know shops that are in the area and, and, and anywhere else it's like when you don't have that it just becomes it's a barrier not an insurmountable one you could you know you figure it out you make sure you bring quarters or you know you get you practice your parallel parking whatever the case may be but at alternate like knowing you pulled into that wide open lot you knew you'd have a spot pulled right in there you knew there would be space and you didn't have to worry about the time I think more than anything, that's probably the the, the biggest piece of this. It's just that you knew you were there as long as as long as you wanted to be. And many of us took full advantage of that. Eminently well said. I mean, how many times did I arrive, perhaps at ten in the morning, and I'm getting in my car to go home at nine o'clock at night? And you and I would go to movies. I, I would leave my car there and not worry about it. We would go to comic conventions. We would meet there yeah, early fine. in the morning and yeah. not be there until late at night. Yeah. How do Very- you like that for a segue? Speaking of conventions, <laughs> ah, the best laid plans. So uh, if, if there's been any kind of uh, ongoing thread over these final episodes, it's been a, a planned, and, and still happening to some extent, a planned reunion of the Alternate Realities Gang at Terrificon, the convention that's taking place late July at Mohegan Sun in Connecticut. Four weeks yeah, just from, a, f- a few weeks from from when you and I are recording this. And this was all initiated by Dr. Bill, who was the guest for our first For All Seasons episode. I guess the two of you had a conversation, and he expressed this idea of wanting to organize this reunion, get get the AR crew to come to a destination convention. That was the that was the inception point. He wanted everyone to like fly to Chicago for C2E2, for example, right? Yes, oh, uh, and I think Her- Heroes was already uh, also surfaced. Um, C2E2, Chicago, Heroes, there might have been something on the West Coast. Um, and then you, you were the one that kind of said like, uh, hey, why don't we try Terrificon? That way a lot of people who live locally can just drive up. Yeah, that was my feeling because... You get more more attendance. Look, we just talked about how hard it is to get the group to commit to a dinner. So I thought the idea of, of getting people to commit, let alone lay out the money and, and everything for airfare and hotel and, and everything involved in a destination trip. I was like, okay, something like Terrificon. I mean, for Bill, he lives in New Mexico. It's a trip for him no matter what. But for the rest of us who are, who are more or less in the same general area, Terrificon felt like kind of a nice a nice balance because it's far enough away for people who want to make it a weekend. You can, but if because of time, budget, preference, you want to do one, you want day. to do it in a day, you can. It'd be a little bit of a hike, but you can do it. So every people got on board with that. Bill was Bill was happy with the idea. Bill and I made plans to share a hotel. We're gonna share the room, and boy, you talk about flat squirrel, man. And I'm wrestling with this. I don't know. When I get to the end of the story here, audience, you'll know what I mean, where I'm like, I really don't know what, what the right answer is here, what lesson to take away. Because uh, so first, the first time I checked the hotel rate for Mohegan Sun, it was like 279 for the event rate for, for the convention. And 
I was like, okay, but I, I put it on my list. I was like, I gotta book the hotel. And I had a conversation with you and I was like, yeah, like I know it's still, this was months ago. And I was like, I know it's a while, ago, well, a while away, but let me just do it just in case. And I dragged my feet. And the next time that I checked, it shot up to like 470. Oh, no, it was 249, I think. And then it shot up to like 479, something like that. Almost $500 a night. And I'm kicking myself. And I'm like, you're the guy. You end every show by saying, don't be a flat squirrel. And you got flat squirreled. Ah, oh, it, it drove me nuts. But I was still like, okay, splitting the room. We're going to make a weekend out of it. I'm going to book it now before it goes up even more. And it has gone up. Yes, more. it has. Yeah. So I was like, okay. So I did that. And I also, because I got burned with the hotel, I was like, well, let me get my tickets now too. Not that the price would go up, but just in case they sell out. It seems unlikely, but I was like, well, let me just get it. So I go on Ticketmaster, create my account. I buy my three-day pass, right? Bill and I didn't even talk about, would we actually go to the show all three days? I was, like, I was just excited. I got, the, I got the pass for all three days. So uh, between the ticket and the Ticketmaster fees, 125 bucks, okay? So I'm all set. I'm ready to go. The one thing that hasn't happened yet, though, is Bill had not yet booked his flight from New Mexico to the, to the East Coast or, or made his other travel plans exactly what he was going to do when he got here and, and, and this and that. But the, the airfare, that was the big thing. And so, you know, checking in with him and, and I say, hey, have you, have you booked your trip yet? And, uh, you know, he, he hadn't yet. He was, he was trying to work out logistics um, with his ex and, the, and, the, and their child and, and all of that. And unfortunately... In the end, it was, he was not able to get the dates to work out. He couldn't coordinate what he needed to. And so Bill, the, the person who, who the got catal- the ball the catalyst. rolling. Yeah, the catalyst. The catalyst. Perfect term. He's a chemist. So the catalyst for this reaction is not coming. <laughs> and in fairness, you and Tom, you guys are going to be sharing room. You're still going. Uh, Drew's going to pop up for a bit. Uh, San Gregorio. Uh, Carolyn, I think Pete might go. So there are a few people who are still going. No, no, Steve Odo. He was never. He was never planning to go. Uh, Bill, to his credit, I will. He was very gracious. He offered to still pay for his share of the hotel so that I could go if I wanted to. But I, I appreciate that. But ultimately, you know, I wanted to go to hang out with everyone, but especially Bill. It's like I have not seen him in person in in years. I know. In years. It was winter 2020, right before everything happened. Exactly. Uh, at one of the Illuminati brunches um, at that diner on Central Avenue. <laughs> so <laughs> out of context, we're like, what is that? The uh, the Illuminati, the AR oh, Illuminati. Sorry. Yeah. The, the, we, we, this little brunch group, we met like three New Year's days for brunch, three years in a row. And uh, we joked that we were like setting the, uh, you know, we were, we were planning the the next year for the world. Or whatever, and then after COVID, it's like ah, I don't think we should say that because <laughs> we didn't do such a good job. Anyway, that was the last time we saw him. Right, correct. Uh, so, so I'm, I'm not going. Is the short version? <laughs> okay. Uh, Bill came to me, and Anthony, I don't know when. I think Bill sent out a big Facebook going, "Hey, well, well first he talked to you, then he posted that, right." Um, and you can help me because I'm not on Facebook. When did he post that? Because he did it after he spoke with you, or did he just try to solicit interest in a destination? And then we comp or you suggested let's do terrific con. Yeah, no, he talked to you, and then I didn't hear any. And then I, the next thing, or the first thing I saw was the Facebook post. That was it. And then I commented, and I was like, "Hey, how about terrific con?" When then, when did he do the Facebook? Post. It was probably the, the day after he talked to you. I don't, I don't remember. I don't remember. Offhand. I don't remember offhand. Okay. But it, it seemed to be pretty fresh. Okay. So here's my sense of things, and you've graciously spoken about me being the elder statesman or, you know, uh, the uh, uncle like avuncular, right? Bill is the heart. Bill is the heart of AR. No, I don't think anyone has greater love for AR. I don't. The work he's put in, right? Um, I think, and I, I I say this with concern and love and respect, I started reflecting on how lonely he must get out in New Mexico because his whole theme, there were times he'd go in, you know, unlock the door at 11 o'clock at night and spend three hours cleaning shelves and he would just, He's, he was a, a dreadnought. He was a working machine. 
So when, when we spoke in the winter, I was real conscious of how alone and lonely he must be. Um, so he was the catalyst for this. I mean, I think Tom might have asked me a year or two ago, are you going to go? I said, no, I'm, I'm kind of done. But this reignited my interest. Let's get everyone, let's have a, go to a convention. Because in prior years, I've gone to conventions with Tom and Drew. We've gone to Heroes Con. Bill drove in from New Mexico. Um, we've gone to conventions in Philadelphia with Bill when he was going to a graduate school down there. Um, or maybe doc- getting his doctorate. I forget which was with. Maybe his, his doctorate. So it was always a blast when about 10 or 12 of us would be in another town. Let's find a restaurant. Let's do stuff. I th- I was conscious of how, you know, he's, he's alone. He doesn't have his AR uh, cohorts. Uh, and then he very almost simultaneously, the lightning bolt struck. He met this woman named Nisha, I think, and they have hit it off. And I think he's just totally in love and he deserves, he deserves happiness. I think he's got so much going on now because he's told me he's planning to move into her house hopefully by year end. And he's trying to sell a lot of stuff and get rid of a lot of stuff just because space uh, space is uh, limited. But the whole dynamic changed. I think if, if he had not met Nisha, I think we'd be seeing him a month from now. Perhaps, perhaps. I, I, all my conversations with him recently have been via text. So, yeah, I, I don't know. But in any event, it's, it's all good. Look, I, I can't, I can't be too mad at the guy. For, for one thing, his heart truly, I think, is in the right place. And I think at the outset of this, his intention really was like, I want to put this together. I want, I want to do this and, and come out for it. Uh, and even even that aside, we humped those long boxes together, so it's all good. You worked in the you but, worked in the coal mines together, but it's you know I, when I uh, so my next step then so I decided not to go because uh, and this is not a slight towards anyone else because it's funny when I I told Mike San Gregorio this and he was like I don't understand like like, like some of us are still going to go and it's just that again Bill Bill coming in that was kind of really the 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 main driver for me because again even though we don't all get together that much anymore at least i've still seen people whereas i haven't seen him at all and i don't know i guess it was just kind of this idea of more like the reunion aspect and it's like now again people are still going but a bunch seem to be kind of like popping in and out and i know at conventions people tend to usually have like a very like set objective and whereas bill's whole thing seemed to be like this was you know kind of like this is what the weekend was about yeah uh, so I just when, once he wasn't going and again, we were going to share the room together and all that. I just kind of felt it like let the wind out of my sails. And I was like, you know what? Let me just take the weekend to myself. I'll get some other stuff done and it's fine. Uh, but so then my next step was uh, trying to unload the tickets that I bought. You can't return them on on Ticketmaster and uh, drew Cheskin to the rescue. He he bought my Saturday and Sunday passes for me. And this might sound like a weird thing to share, but it's just like I think it, it illustrates the dynamic within our group because I I forget the math offhand here, but essentially it would have been $85 for him to buy those two days at the door. It would have been like 40 and 45 or 45 and 40 for Saturday and Sunday, 85 for him to buy them at the door, which was what his plan was. And so I was like, Hey, you could have them for, what did I say? Like 75 or whatever. Like I just wanted to, you know, get recoup some you wanted of my to money. Mitigate, yeah. mitigate your spend. Yeah, and I wanted to make it more a- attractive for him. It's like, why, you know, why buy them for me if you could buy them from the door at the same point? Anyway, uh, and he was <laughs> so nice. He wrote back. He's like, well, let me give you 90 because it's the convenience for me. I don't have to get them oh, at the door. And I was like, no. He no. is so generous. It was very nice. But I think like that, again, I, I share that because I think that speaks to the dynamic of our group where it's like we're, not that it was arguing, but it's like we're negotiating against our own interest for the for the, other, the, the, the benefit other. of the other. Uh, we ultimately landed on I think eighty. So at the moment, I still have a Friday ticket um, that if I can't sell, it'll it'll cost me forty five dollars not to go <laughs> not to go to this convention. But all in all, I got my refund for the hotel and all that, so it, it could have been worse. Now you might have noticed. Have you gotten your tickets yet? Or are you going to get them Tom, at the door? Uh, Tom, I took care of the hotel. Gotcha. Tom took care of the tickets for, okay. uh, 
and I think we got all three days. My plan is to do just Friday and Saturday, wake up Sunday morning and head back. That's my plan. I, I didn't know that. I kind of assumed you were going to get them at the door, but I didn't even bother uh, asking if you wanted to buy. What are you crinkling your bottle? <laughs> um, I didn't even bother asking if you wanted wanted my ticket because that would require you to have a Ticketmaster account, and I just oh, assumed you, the that your, your company is... firewall would block it, and so I was I didn't even bother. But I was but that's good. I'm glad you have your ticket. I'll probably put this episode out maybe mid July, the week before Terrificon. So if there's any audience member out there uh, who needs a Friday ticket, please let me know. I, I have one. I have one at the moment. I give you a good deal on it, but. Anyway, uh, yeah, it's disappointing. I hope that at some point, you know, uh, something like this can come together again. I know Bill meant well. He intended to. It, it just didn't happen. I think this was eyes bigger than the stomach sort of situation where I think the idea of it was really attractive and he wanted to do it. And it, it just uh, it didn't come together. But it was still a great idea. And I, I really hope you guys have a great time. And I'm sure you will. Well, I'll give you a report. Give you a report. I agree with you. Bill's love for the store and the love for the camaraderie and the family. I think this is just pent up, you know, with COVID and living out there as long as he has. I think he really wanted to reconnect, you know. Uh even even when um we had the brunch, as we were leaving in the parking lot, he said, Hey. You want to go over to Oh Yeah? I, I I hear they're selling like trades for $5 a piece. So he went over to Oh Yeah and he bought like two Neil Adams uh, Green Lantern, Green Arrow trades, read them on the plane on the way back. He, he and I have spoken about this. There are times when I've done this, he's done it. You just want to walk around in a comic store. You might not buy anything, but just to see what's on the wall and what's popular and and to uh, flip through back issues. Um, he is the heart of AR. Drew is the most generous. Like, there's times I've needed help or advice. You call Drew and he makes time. And he's he always puts the other guy's concerns top of the list. Uh, so I will be talking to Bill. Uh, I just think he's he's hitting on all cylinders with Nietzsche. Nietzsche. Yeah, he's, sure a, right he's a man in love and to, I don't know, again, I don't know if if the result would have been the same in terms of coordinating dates. Anyway, uh, whatever the case may be, I'm very happy for him. Um, yeah, I'm bummed that he won't he won't be coming out, you know, convention aside. But yeah, again, like with Bill in particular, and you've mentioned those, those times when he would come to the store. Yeah, I mean, obviously he grew up in the area and he went to college at Fordham, as did I, as did you. So all three of us have that in common. And so... Really, I think really for that whole time, like he was always at the store and was able to get to the store all the time. And then, I mean, it was probably later on when I really got to know him and definitely that whole stretch when he was at Johns Hopkins, right? But that was still close enough where he would take those occasional trips up or when Steve would, you know, go to Japan for a week and Bill would come up and like any opportunity he had to come to the store, he would. And obviously over these past, however many years it's been since he's been in New Mexico, certainly that's been a lot more challenging. And to your point, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm sure it's been very isolating. I mean, I, th I think about that, too. like, even if, even if Steph Milo and I like all went out there, um, you know, as, as he, as he and his family did initially, it's like, still like, you just don't have your network. You know, it's, it's, it's hard to really, I'm, I say it as if I know, I mean, I've never done it. I'm sure it's like, very hard to, to start from scratch. And I, I, at different times in my life, I worked in Phoenix for about five months. Um, I worked in Santa Fe, New Mexico. The brown out there. I mean, I in both those towns. I'm so, we're so used to all the green around here and the change of the season. And there were times, um, at this at that point in time, I could only fly home every every other weekend. The airfare was expensive, and the time you'd lose so much time. Um, that being said. I got so sick of the desert and the brown. Every time I drove over a hill, I hoped to see the sort of green trees or foliage or just flowers and stuff that we have here. I got so sick of the desert. And that's got to wear on him, too. I know that he'll drive up to, um, I forget, El Paso and stuff like that. He'll drive like two hours just to go to a comic book store and walk around. He did tell me, 
he went into some comic book store years ago and he started talking to the owner, where you're from? I'm from New York. Guy goes, I just saw this documentary about this crazy Asian guy <laughs> who was like out screaming at, you know, thunderstorms. And Bill said, I know that guy. I got to say, and I, I don't I don't mean to be self-serving, but between the documentaries, well, really, including the, the J1 as well, the, the, the various documentaries and, and all of these podcast episodes, it's it's not like everybody knows our store, but I think a decent number of people do around the country and the world. And yeah, you got recognized at a convention at Terrificon, right? I got, and in other stores, look what uh, Sean, Sean Hendrick did, right? I walked in there, he, he scared the piss out of me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love, I mean, that's, that's amazing to me. I, you know, that, that's fantastic. And so again, even though even though our store is not here, that the the legacy lives on and that other people have, to some degree or another, experienced what Alternate Realities was about, that's a point of pride. That really means a lot. Tying up the Terrificon bit. So yeah, I won't be there, unfortunately, I, but I hope you guys have a lot of fun. I'm sure you will. Audience, if you if you run into Rich Roney or any other Alternate Realities alum and you listen to the show, talk to them, reach out. I'm sure they, you know, I don't want to speak for you guys, but I, you know, I'm sure they would enjoy that, as would I. And it's funny with Bill, because I think, I think he might have said to you, like, oh, maybe next year. Now, I've learned my lesson. <laughs> and even, too, with our, our upcoming series finale from the start, he's been like, I'll fly in. I'll do the recording in person. And it's like, all right, if you can, great. <laughs> Again, I think the intention is there, but I don't want to get ahead of ourselves. But this is where I see I still don't know uh, about kind of the, the parable of the flat squirrel and hesitation kills and how that plays out in this instance, because there were aspects of this where hesitation did work against me but then with the tickets in particular that was that was a time where i actually should have just kind of hung back so there's there's always a little bit of balance to be to be struck here but lesson learned oh yeah comics celebrates and promotes everything that is wonderful about comics toys artwork and the joy they bring to people visit them in person at one of their three locations harrison new york which happens to be my local comic shop skokie illinois or muncie indiana if you have children and have been looking for a family-friendly store, look no further. Join All Yeah for exciting events, including creator signings, how-tos, and more. Visit awyeahcomics.com and follow All Yeah on social media for more. Their name says exactly how they feel about it. Say it with me. Aw yeah! Filmmakers and movie fans alike should be sure to attend these film festivals. Brightside Tavern in Jersey City, Hang On to Your Shorts in Asbury Park, Point Lookout on Long Island, and In the Cut in Bloomfield, New Jersey. On a personal note, my short film, By Spoon, The J. Mizell Story, played at these fests, so I know firsthand what fun and well-run events they are. Submission information for filmmakers, as well as details about the festivals, can be found at filmfreeway.com. Follow the festivals on social media for news about events, discounts, tickets, and more. Also, listen to the Hang On To Your Shorts and Cullen On Film podcasts available via a shared universe network. What else would you like to talk about? Let's see. Uh, at, at the moment, this Oh, is, I got one more thing. Well, so I'm glad cuz I was I had a real vacuum there. No, so I know we well, look, we we it busted your chops about you keep your cell phone off and I know we've talked about a lot over the years about you don't have Wi-Fi at home. You still don't have Wi-Fi. It was insane to me. But I'm not calling you insane, but the situation is insane to me. But <laughs> I, this is this was so I was so happy to hear this that you because we've talked about this on the show, the flat screen television that you had you had inherited from your mother and the Blu-ray player mm -hmm. that we had gotten you as a gift. And I always include this part of the story that it was so long ago that we got to- You said that multiple technologies. Well, uh, yeah, that, but that it was so long ago, it was so expensive that we like pooled, we pooled our money to buy you one. And I say that because if you say say to someone now, like, oh yeah, a few of us got someone a Blu-ray player. It's like a, a few of you, it's like, like, like 50 bucks. Um, but this was years ago, but you, you set up the flat screen and the Blu-ray player. I was so delighted. You can think that if you want to. No, you you told you told me you watched. Uh, I know. I told you that. No. I, I bought a little portable Blu-ray player. <laughs> I bought this little portable thing that's the size of my laptop. I don't have the 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 brains to hook all that stuff up. 
No, you're joking. No, I'm serious. Wait. I'm, I'm being totally Ooh. candid. Um, no. Listen, you got me bearing my soul to your audience. Wait, wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. This, but folks, this is not a bit. I Wait. Because you told me, I think what- I know I told you because I figured you would get the answer <gasps> that would that would mitigate no. subsequent questions. No. I feel like you're messing with me. No, I'm not. No. I'm, I lied to you before because it, <laughs> it terminated the conversation. Because oh, this came up, I guess, with the, the Zack Snyder movies, right? I feel like that was the impetus for this where you had watched, was it- all of them, right? Or BVS, or and definitely then Zack Snyder's Justice League, right? Uh, the only I, I've seen all of them. Man of Steel, ten years ago, ten years ago, right now, and then I bought um the DVD of Batman v Superman, the the extended one, and I loved it. Um, and then the Joss Whedon version of Justice League came out, and then you talked up the um. The original Snyder cut. You you said yeah. it's a different movie, right? And I think you stayed up like at two in the morning and watched it when it was first. Uh, I watched that from three a.m. to seven a.m. in, okay. in March twenty twenty one. It was okay. magnificent. So to obviate embarrassing discussion, I told you what you wanted to hear, right? Because it was in the context of the Snyder Cut. Yes, you it was. It on yes, yes. Because so, I think when we... Cause I yes, feel like, you're absolutely right. Because I, I think... You're absolutely right. And I feel like you mentioned in the movie... I don't think you were like, hey, I watched the Blu-ray. I think you, you mentioned the movie, and I think I said, like, how did you watch it? Yeah. And, and then I fear, uh-oh, I don't want him to think I got these two huge bookends of just, like, things holding stuff up that are still in their boxes, which I do. But I, 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 I went to Walmart and bought this little portable Blu-ray player. And with a screen that's like, you know, eight inches by five inches. And I watched it on that. Uh, this is so disheartening. What, I, the fact that you lied, I, that's fine. But I just don't. Why? <laughs> but oh. An- Anthony, procrastination. <clears throat> procrastination. Wait, how big is it? You said it's about the size of your laptop. Your, oh, my God. That's how you watch Zack Snyder's Justice League? <laughs> oh, my uh, God. Boy, you got you to gotta get this picture displayed when you were just rubbing your head like... Bad enough you came in before we recorded and you told me you love the Flash. Now, this this is a travesty. No. I, here, and, and bad news and, travels in oh threes. Oh, God, what? <laughs> yeah, what's next? <laughs> he, I mean, but here's the thing. Where, look, you 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 do you. It's all it's all good. It doesn't affect me. But uh, when you say procrastination, it's like you took the step of going to the store and buying a portable Blu-ray player. So it's like the time that it took to do that but here's the thing, and I, I don't like I don't say this to be uh to, to, to be flip or anything. I like sincerely, when you talk about setting it up, I can't wait till you, me, uh, Bill, and Steve get together. <laughs> but it's just like when, when we talk about setting up the TV and Blu-ray player. I mean, I, and I I'm not exaggerating. Like it's literally you plug the TV into the wall, you plug the Blu-ray player into the wall, and you you take you connect the Blu-ray player to the TV with an HDMI cable. Like that's it. Like that's it. Okay. Okay, so it's a three-step. You three plug step. both things into the wall, and, and then you <laughs> connect the two. And you connect. That's it. Okay, good to know. Good to know. Good to know. I'm floored, honestly. I, I'm boy. I'm glad I didn't. I was. I was this close to being like, all right, we'll sign off. We'll see you in the fall. Ah, uh, because I was genuinely like, uh, that's the thing. When you told me that, I was so pleased that he took some initiative. It wasn't even that. It, you know, honestly, what I think what it's what it's only ever been is that. Uh, and it's this, it's funny too. It's the same reason why I would love for you to get Wi-Fi and to get Netflix and Max and Disney plus or, or one of those or something, because, you know, you, you follow these characters, you know, your whole life. And there are all of these different shows and movies and things to varying degrees of quality. I'm not saying, oh, you'll love them all. You got to watch every single thing. There's kind of an overwhelming amount of stuff, to be honest, but there's so much there and it's like you you could enjoy these and enjoy them in the best presentation possible right on a nice big flat screen tv with this with the with the blu-ray i mean even again even <laughs> blu-ray it's like now you really should get a 4k player but anyway <laughs> but uh oh it breaks my heart that you watched that you watched it on a screen the size of a lap i mean it's not the end of the world i know people watch stuff that way people watch stuff on their phones oh i'm gutted going back to uh, how we felt when we saw the store dismantled <laughs> So you know what? This does harken back to everything we discussed just prior to activating this recording. 
I should have kept silent and preserved the original timeline. The original timeline. I think you should have. I feel like... <laughs> I was happy in my in my ignorance where I was like I was And you know, back when you asked me, I said, I gotta tell him I hooked it up because I'm really opening the door. I'm letting the I'm I'm opening the door for such an avalanche of criticism. But Anthony <laughs> my my brothers have told me this. Many people have I resist change like nobody's business. I I guess I just uh I don't mean to belabor the point or or, or, or pick on you. It's you know what it is? It's just that like cuz I'm trying to appro- I'm trying to look at this <laughs> lo- logically and the thing is if it's not like I don't know. I wouldn't ex- like look, people can't see the setup that we have here. I've got my mixer and I've got multiple cameras and we've got a few things going on here. Like, yeah, that's not your area of expertise. I wouldn't expect you to be able to just kind of like plug something like this in and and go. But it's just you you've had televisions across your life. You you have and use a DVD player. So I guess that's what it is. It's that see, this is the the, the lawyerly analytical. Boy, boy, boy. The high, yeah, the <laughs> analytical processor, highly analytical. Yeah, I'm just analogizing. Like that I think that's that's what I think it is for me, where you like you have a television play a a television and a dvd player that are that are connected and so you watch dvds on that player on that television so it's like it's the exact same principle and setup it's just a a bigger tv and a different kind of player i think that's why i I have such a hard time with this because it's not like oh you've got to run all this wiring there's a lot of huge setup involved i wonder if that blu-ray player even still works i mean it should but at the same time there's no way of knowing in the box it's like we always joke with Steve. All these unopened, you know, CDs and DVDs and Blu-rays he has. It's like oh, you don't know if it plays until you actually pop it in. Also, these things, all these discs, not so much with the player, but all these discs, they don't last forever. So anyway, so I, I'm what def- else? I'm new? deflated. I, I I I don't know. I think I think that's it. I think that's all I got. <laughs> All right, wait, let me, I'll end on a sincere note. I'm flabbergasted, though. I I don't know if the audience... What worries me is for your audience, I'm looking at your face and your eyes now, and you're talking to me, but the the your eyes are conveying such a level of, this is insane. This is total, this guy's a total nut. <laughs> uh, yeah, I want to hear, listen, we don't, I, I, it, it's funny, with the Superman show, and so I hear from people all the time, I love it. I, I, well, I don't tend to hear from as many people about this show anymore, and I don't know if it's if people have dropped off or they just uh, they don't feel it begs a response. I don't. Know. But please, audience, I, I I would love to hear <laughs> some responses to this because I'm flabbergasted. Uh, but I will end on a sincere note with um, actually with with one last question. And so the setup for this, just bear with me for a second. But uh, so I've been listening to the Boy Meets World rewatch podcast, and I know Boy Meets World, you are not the, the target demographic. You've probably never seen an episode, but ABC sitcom in the 90s. Anyway, three of the cast members are doing a rewatch podcast, and they've been interviewing people who were involved with the show. So they had on recently this family who attended l- literally almost every single live taping of the show. Like, you know how you can be in the studio audience? audience. They were regulars. And they knew the people involved with the show. They actually befriended the cast eventually. And they were just like there all the time. And the people involved with the show came to value them because they were sort of a, like they knew the show better than any audience member. And so like they would kind of use them sometimes oh, to gauge that? like, oh, like, was this funny? Was it not? Blah, blah, blah. So they were on the podcast. And one of the, one of the family members was talking about how like it was such a cool special thing for this family that they were regulars. You see where I'm going with this? At the, at the show, at all of these tapings. But he he rarely tells people about it because it's like it sounds kind of crazy, you know, on 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 paper. Like it it meant so much to us, and if we explain it, but it's just like this because that is pretty extreme, right? Like to go to all of those tapings, but it was such a formative experience for them. But he was like, sometimes it's just like more trouble than it's worth to try to explain. So that's the long walk to the question, which is, and I, like first of all, I don't even know how often, if at all, this even comes up. But like when you're talking to whether it's family members or people from work in particular or anyone else not related to alternate realities, 
how do you describe AR if you do at all? Like, is it a similar thing where you kind of like at people from work, for example, like, have you ever talked to them about the comic shop? And if you have, or if you, you know, if you, if you do currently, like, how, how do you describe it? Because it was, again, different than that Boy Meets World example, but similar in the sense that it was so special and so formative and also something that a lot of people, people listening to this probably get it because we have a lot of people who go to comic book stores. But for people who like don't go to comic book stores, it is kind of a weird thing. It's like, oh, it's a store and you like <laughs> became friends and you go out to dinner and you've, you know, you've, you've had this level of involvement. So that's the, that's the question that I would kind of land on. Okay. Um, I really haven't dis- I haven't really haven't discussed it at work. But that's not that uncommon because many of the people I work with, I don't know what their hobbies or interests are. Maybe only on a, you know, on a superficial level, like someone might go, hey, I'm going to go play golf this weekend, or I never got into it. Um, now, with my family, uh, I've spoken about it, and I took my nephews, all of my nephews, to the store at different times. Um, but I think it circles back to something either either you created or was created by Steve. I can't remember who, but it's the AR community. So the store is synonymous with community. I, I don't look at the store the way I look at, uh, say, a supermarket and you're buying a commodity. Um, perhaps an hour ago, you asked, what's my... What's going on now? Uh, there's three stores in New Jersey that I really like that are all still open. I'm not buying as much because my my reading is just, it's not grabbing me. The storylines or the, I've seen so much of it before, it's repetitive. But the three stores I like the most are Zap Comics, Fat Moose, and Dewey's. Dewey's has since relocated to... Uh, uh, the Joe Kubert School, new ownership, stuff like that. But um, each of them is... No, I don't, I don't mean to cut you off, but and I don't mean to, you know, kind of to badger the witness either. I'm just, I guess what I'm getting at is, like, let's say, for like for argument's sake, you, I don't know, you, you had a, a comic in your car and, like, one of your coworkers happened to see it. And, like, oh, like, you read comics. Like, let's say you've never talked to this person about it. Um, like, would... I mean, again, I guess that's more on the on the realm of comics, and I guess my my question is more about the store itself. But it's like, I guess how how specific would you get about alternate realities? Like, if it if somehow the you mentioned, like, yeah, like I like comics, and it's like, oh, what store do you go to? Like, would you say something like, oh, there was the store that was, you know, it meant the world to me, and I became best friends with all of you? Like, would you like get into that, or would you just kind of not not get into that level of depth? And if not, is it more a function of because it's a coworker, or is it just that? It is kind of hard to explain for people who 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 don't know. It would depend on the personality of the coworker, right? Um, there are some friends at work, uh, people who've reported to me that I've told about this. Now, one of the fellas, um, he's perhaps 15, 16, 17 years younger than me, uh, but he was really into Marvel. Right. So I could talk to him about certain things when he was a teenager or, or in college. Um, but most of the people I know at work are not into comics. I mean, they're actuaries or yeah. they're in the, the law department. We're very focused on reviewing something uh, that needs an answer quickly. It doesn't lend itself to. Or even, I, you know, I don't know, like if you went on a date or like you ran it, like you, I don't know, I don't know, just in conversation, like even like take, because I understand work maybe as a specific circumstance, but I guess just someone who, a friend or acquaintance, like who's not in this world at all, um, you know, is, yes, you know, how would you, about? yeah, like, you know, to what extent would you talk about the store? How easy would it be to explain to someone, do you think, about what this was? I'd have to gauge the person, right? Some of them I could expand and really get into it and say, hey, look, these are my friends, right? The store just happened to be um, where we dug coal, yeah. right? <laughs> um, others, given their personality, they might be more reticent. I'm, I'm not even going to open it because I do think it is hard to explain. 
I mean, the fact, quite frankly, right, I got to think this through. You purchased that Superman book when you were five, right? Um, in the Galleria. Yep. What was that, 93? Yeah, 90, 90, late 92. Okay. Steve opened in 92, right? So it's just hard to explain. I mean, I not that I'm embarrassed, but I might not open it, open the door because it's so hard to explain like, you know, it, well, yeah. you got to understand I went to, you know, L, uh, high school with this guy, then he did this, then we met other people, we got together, we had... No, that's the thing. And I'm not, impl- like, that's the thing. I'm not, I'm, I don't want to frame it as like, oh, it's an embarrass. It's like, a, we're not embarrassed about it. But yeah, it is just kind of this, it is such a specific experience to have had with a retail establishment that again, for people who are in the comic book space, that makes sense. And certainly there are equivalents that I think people w- would also get what we're talking about. Like if you know, we're talking about video games or uh, sneakers or, or golf, whatever. Uh, uh, yeah. But. Or hunting. I mean. Sure, like when we're getting just like hobbies generally, I guess. Yeah, I know that my brother Steve uh, will go hunting and fishing with certain people, and he might either meet them uh, at the hunting club and become friends through that. Um, uh, you you hit on it, right? I'm going to make this fast because I know you're trying to wrap this up. But when you went to um, Joker's Child, right? And you were filming there, and we got to get back and meet the guys for dinner. I guess the owner said, what do you mean? You go out to dinner with your the people who work for you? It was a foreign idea even to that. So it's very unusual. I treasure these friendships. Um, I'm happy to talk about them. But it might be the sort of thing, if I may, if I'm making small talk at a conference before, you know, we're taking a 15-minute break and we're going to reconvene. Uh, yeah, what did you do this weekend? I just met some friends for dinner. I, w- I will leave it at that. Right. Because... To, to open it and let it breathe, it would take time. I hear you. No, and that's what I was, I was curious about. All right. All right, folks. So to recap, uh, Bill and I are not going to Terrificon. Some of the Alternate Realities gang uh, is. Uh, we still keep in touch, but uh, not as much. We don't have these big gatherings. Uh, it's tough to talk about this. And uh, Rich Roney lied and has still not set up his flat screen television and Blu-ray player and instead went out and bought a portable Blu-ray player that's the size of his laptop screen. That's that's where we are as we head into our series finale next episode. <laughs> oh, my goodness. All right. Well, had I but known I was going to give you the punchline. Had I but known. There's still a part of me that thinks that when we're done, you're going to be like, ah, I was just messing with you. Like, I thought it would be fun to talk to, to have that conversation. But I actually did set up my television. There's some part of me that's there's part of me that's hoping that's the case. I, I th- This is uh, demoralizing. <laughs> Not that I was lied to. I just, it, it uh, I think as someone who really enjoys watching and I've watched you know, I think about this a lot and, and also just, you know, and one more quick plug here. I have a Power Rangers podcast, right? Summoning the Zords. I've been going back and I've been rewatching all these episodes of Power Rangers that I watched as a little kid. But I have these memories. It's like I've I've always had my shows and I've always had to watch them the best possible way that I can, right? And as a kid, it was on a tube TV and then then it was the flat screen and I recently got a 4K Blu-ray player. I barely have any 4K Blu-ray. <laughs> it's like I want the ability just in case. Uh, so I think it's, it's, it's mostly that it's just like, oh man, I want you to enjoy these the best way that you can. And, uh, you know, on a portable player while your other devices sit unplugged is not the way. So at the same time, if that's how, if you're enjoying them that way, great. <laughs> anyway, I hope you and the gang have a great time at Terrificon, uh, to any of our audience members who are going, I hope you enjoy uh, I thank you as always for tuning in. As I've mentioned a number of times, we've got other shows. We've got Digging for Kryptonite, Summoning the Zords, and another exciting episode in The Adventures of Superman. Rich has been on two out of those three shows. I'll give you one guess which one he's not been on. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I hope you'll check them out. They've been a lot of fun and you can get them wherever you you listen to podcasts or you can watch them on YouTube. Rich, thank you very much. Thank you for, this was wonderful. Really, I really enjoyed it. I really, a lot of laughs. This was really a lot of fun. Thank you audience as always. Listen, Next time, it is the series finale of My Comic Shop History. It's For All Seasons, Chapter 4, Fall, and will be debuting this fall, uh, next quarter. Rich will be back. Steve will be back. Bill will hopefully be with us either in person or digitally or in spirit, if if nothing else. But uh, we're bringing this this ship in, and it's the end of an era, and I think it'll be 
just like that season one finale that we were talking about before. I think this will be a, a special and momentous recording. I'm it's bittersweet. I'm excited to do it, but there's also this just this this knowing that like, well, that'll be it for this podcast series. But it's been a great ride, and I hope you will join us next time for the series finale of My Comic Shop History. As always, don't be a flat squirrel. Hey! And so it goes. And so it goes on. And so it goes. Time to move.